Hello, hello, good evening and welcome to the TNT show. You know, it's another great day for British democracy. Today we learned that uh, the SNP and independents are riding very high in the polls, in fact, exceptionally so. And what is Westminster's response? Uh, they have just opened a huge white elephant of a building in Edinburgh to help get across London's policies to Scotland. <laughs> Couldn't make it up. Hello, I'm John Drummond, <clears throat> and I'm your host for the next uh, 60 exciting minutes. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have yet another great guest. I know what you're thinking, you always have great guests, and we do, you're right. And I'm really excited that she's been able to join us this evening. Stay tuned to hear about India, organic farming, and being an MEP. And we're taking your questions live. But first, a few words about TNT. TST stands for The Nation Talks. So in many respects, this is your show. This is your show. You're the nation. Uh, you're out there. You can talk to us anytime you like. And if you need to get in touch, and I hope you will, the details are on the screen, or you can go to India Live and find the details there. Get in touch. Give us your questions. Now, to our guest tonight, The Nation Talks to Heather Anderson. How are you, Heather? How are you coping with the pandemic? Oh, wow. Um, the pandemic. Well, I'm an organic farmer with a farm shop and a cafe and an art gallery here. I mean, I don't run all these things, but they're here on the farm. And when the lockdown started, every uh, started everything closed. Um, and then we went into an incredibly busy and distressing two months of changing the business completely to just do home deliveries. So like lots and lots of small businesses, we just had to hit the ground running, get our website working, um, deal with people who were frightened and distressed and really worried about getting food. You know, we had the toilet roll, you know, emergency. We, had, we couldn't get yeast. Everybody was buying flour. So it was incredibly busy. Um, and it's now calming down a bit, but we're still doing home deliveries and not opening the shop because we're just trying to get food to people with low risk. So people can locate you and, and, and Whitmuir. Where is Whitmuir located? Uh, 16 miles from John Lewis in Edinburgh. There you are. <laughs> it's on the A701, exactly 16 miles from John Lewis's front door. Okay. Um, so we're just up from West Linton, just down from Leadburn, just along from Pennycook. Good. And are you open seven days a week? Well, we not that we were open seven days a week for the last sort of fifteen years, um, but now um, the, the plant nursery here they're open, and we've got an antique shop which is going to be open at the weekends, and we're doing home deliveries. So, and you're welcome to come and walk around the farm. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I think people should do that. I hope they will. I hope <laughs> they do. I hope they do. Now, you were born in Dundee, a bit like our guest last week, Brian Cox. Yeah. yeah. But your journey from Dundee to Whitmuir included India and Zambia. How did all that happen? Well, the thing about Dundee, it was the centre of the Jute Empire. You know, I remember going to Verdant Works in Dundee and realising that, you know, the tents that were in the Korean War were from Jute made in Dundee. All the ropes were from Jute made in Dundee. Every city was from Jute from Dundee. So my dad was a Jute mill manager. Um, and when I was three months old, I was three months premature um, and left in an incubator and shouldn't really have lived. Um, my mum said it was a, the weight of a bag and a half of sugar. Um, and the doctor said, be good to get this bean to the heat. So at three months old, we went out to India um, and had an ayah. So the first sort of six years of my life, I was out in India and Pakistan with an ayah. Um, my mum said I was very, very prejudiced because I wouldn't play with any of the white kids on the boat coming back. I just, my first language was Hindustani. I had shock white hair, but um, was very articulate in Hindustani and played with all the Indian and Pakistani kids. You, you, you spoke Hindi? Yeah, that was my first language. Yeah. I don't remember any of it now, but I oh, love my ayah. I was about to ask you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, my mum said I always used to, um, when we came back, there was a European side of the boat. This is a long time ago. This is the early 60s. Um, and um, an, an Indian side of the boat. And I kept running around to the Indian side of the boat to find somebody with sari because I like the silk. <laughs> yeah. But lots of people in Dundee were out in, in um, India. And then 
in Zambia, my dad was invited to go out and open the first combined jute and hemp mill in Zambia. And that was a different contract because that wasn't, you know, a colonial Britain. Zambia was an independent country and my dad went out as a guest worker. Um, so very, very lucky to be in Zambia for two years. Um, loved the country, um, and I, but I decided that I had to come back and go to school. Um, for secondary. So I got on the plane back from Zambia on my own. I can't believe this now, right? And, and my granddad said, I stayed with my gran and granddad a lot, but my granddad said he couldn't get over opening the door. And I was tipping the taxi driver at the age of um, 12 saying, Grandy, I'm back for the scale. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... <laughs> and we didn't have mobile phones. You can't imagine that, can you? So my mum hadn't even sent a telegram said, saying the bairn's coming home, you know, but... So we, we had a, the life of Riley, really. Oh, really? You found your way from uh, Zambia, yeah. presumably to London, and yeah, then to, London, to Heathrow. I was an unaccompanied minor, oh, and right. two other kids like me at the back of the plane. Um, and then we changed at Heathrow, got to Edinburgh Airport, and I, I had to get a, a car, a taxi, um, to Waverley. And I vividly remember sort of going down that ramp at Waverley um, Station and this woman who obviously thought, why is this young child carrying bags, you know? And um, she offered to help me and I was very suspicious. Um, but anyway, she got me to the, the, the ticket platform and I got a ticket for a, a train to Dundee and then I got a taxi and they knocked on the door at Court Street, one floor up, saying, Grandy, I'm back. <laughs> and, uh, so I can't. I don't know how that happened, and but that's how it happened back then. What was it like coming back to school in Dundee? Well, I loved the school, um, and I wanted to go to the Morgan. I had a, a, nef a cousin who went to the Morgan Morgan Academy. So um, I should probably admit that we lied about where we lived. Um, so I gave my gran and granddad's address as my home address, so I could get to the Morgan, um, and. I just, I just loved the school. My mum said there was something wrong with me. So when I couldn't, when I, she was saying, you're not very well, take a day off, I would start greeting. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got to get to the scale. Um, so I, I had a great time. I ended up being the head girl at the, the Morgan. And um, so oh, excellent. great memories of the school and the two. And then at some stage, you went to London. Yeah, well, I left, um, I went to Edinburgh University in the early, the late, the early 80s. Um, and, and I went there mainly because, um, this is this great thing about teachers. There was a teacher called Mr. Forrest in the Morgan and he stopped me in the corridor um, in sixth year and said, where's your UCA form? Which is what you had to fill in at go to university. Now I was from up a multi in Dundee, working class background. It never crossed my mind that I would go to university. And my mum's dream was that I got a job in the office at the Timex doing the timesheets. That was the height of her aspirations. And Dr. Forrest said, where's your UCA form? You know, you've got to go to university. And I said, oh, I've not even thought about it. And I had to get my mum to come in with me to meet Dr. Mr. Forrest. And he had to convince her that this was a sensible thing for me to do. So I ended up going to Edinburgh, um, thanks to that teacher who paid attention and noticed, you know. And Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. We it's depend amazing. on teachers looking out for us. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I should have asked you, how did you cope with all the storms last night? And the cows went missing. So this morning, <laughs> there was pee went, up, pee went up the hill and we couldn't see the cows. Uh, but they're back. It's okay. They're not walking down the 701. The cows and the calves are back. Yeah. So I don't think they liked it much. It was pretty dramatic. But... At least it didn't have the terrible consequences it's had up in Aberdeenshire today. Oh, that's just dreadful. Yeah. Hearts go out to the folks there. I yeah. mean, really dreadful. I, I gather three people have, uh, have died there in that crash. Yeah. Which, which is yeah, just terrifying. Yeah, we should count our blessings. Though I have to say it was pretty bad here. Uh, yeah. And, uh, Very unusual lightning. Just kept going. But, well, yeah. it sort of reminded me of lightning. It's sort of weather you get overseas, frankly. It's this. Yeah more commonplace at this time of the year overseas. But uh, to see it here, it's sort of almost like sheet lightning, which is very, very unusual. And torrential rain and the whole the whole thing, you know, just incredible. You were asking how we got to London. So um, this was the early 80s. Um, 
And it, it is that thing. People think nothing changes, but things do change. In the 80s, if you were female, um, you thought you were going to be a secretary. Yeah. And me and my pal Lizzie, um, we basically studied English literature and language at Edinburgh University, had a great time, didn't think about a job at all. And then at the end of the, the period, we thought, God, we better get a job. So we um, went down to the Polytechnic in London to do secretarial and media studies. So we ended up in the east end of London. And um, and I just sort of laughing about that because I was just remembering that one of the things we had to do was give a presentation to the students. Everybody had to take their turn. And me and Lizzie gave a presentation to these uh, quite well-off um to learn how to be personal assistants mm. um, it's part of their finishing school thing and we gave them a lecture on it's Scotland's oil <laughs> <laughs> we had to map and we're saying actually these territorial waters belong to Scotland <laughs> and that was that was way back in the early 80s and um, so just that thing about yeah we were interested in independence back then but we didn't think of ourselves as um, Scottish nationalists who just were making the case they didn't agree with us, but we argued the case. And you marched against Thatcher again. <sighs> the whole of the 80s, um, I think I spent every Saturday on the street, you know. So we had the Falklands War, um, we had Thatcher, we had the miner strike, there was Greenham Common, the anti-nuclear marches. So every weekend was a demonstration of some sort, you know, and... Um, a huge amount of involvement in politics. We ended up having a flat um, that, you know, about, I don't know how many, we had four people living in it in Chelsea and Kensington. And I was in the Labour Party there. And um, way back in the early 80s, and I remember producing a report at the end of the year saying, we have reduced the Conservative majority to four figures. <laughs> <laughs> 9,997 or something like that. But just that. that. Met Jeremy Corbyn, is that right? Oh, God, yeah. Well, one of the, um, oh, he hasn't changed. Um, so after being at um, Secretarial College, I then worked in a community centre in Islington. Um, and I mean, we had the Brixton riots. You know, there was a lot going on in London at that time. You know, a huge amount of civil unrest. Um, and Islington was Jeremy Corbyn's seat, as you know. So yeah. we knew him back then. And he still had those awful suits and looked crumpled at the same, at the same time. And at that point, um, he was pretty much as he, he was at the end. You know, he was revered as the sort of guardian of the values. You know, he, he had the word on what the line was um, and was against the European Union back then. So I didn't know him well. I knew of him and had met him and went to meetings. And my, my favourite thing, this is a great Labour Party trick, that um, if they were wanting to sort something out, they'd give you their own instructions about the meeting. So you went somewhere else. And then they had the, they had the meeting that made the decisions. So that was the early 80s, lots and lots of demonstrations um, and, and great things like Greenham Common. So that burgeoning of the women's movement and all these guys kept yeah. saying, can't we come? And you think, can't you go and do something else? Like, we're doing this. This is our sort of campaign. You can support us, but you don't need to come. We're on our own. Yeah. And, uh, and, and at Greenham... I learned that great tip for life, which is when you're in a really muddy, wet situation, always put carrier bags on your feet inside your boots and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so lots and lots and lots of political upheaval and campaigning. And Maybe, then you yeah. back to Scotland. Yeah, well, um, I think it's, it's that thing, isn't it? Like I went to London because back then in the early 80s, Everybody went to London, you know. Scotland was a very different place. And if you wanted a job and a chance of getting a job, you left, you know. So it's like the earlier exoduses, you know, if you, you're no point in staying here. There's no work for you here. Um, we had in unemployment, um, you know. So you went to London to work. And in London, we had this uh, reputation. Like I was a job case. People would always call you a jock ace in London. And the Scots had this reputation for being incredibly hard working um, and conscientious. So I, I ran the community centre 
um, through the through the eighties. That was the beginning of the the Scottish the Liberal Democrat lot. The old defected left the Labour Party, started a new Ooh. party, um, and unfortunately, that had a real impact on our community centre because we had to get funding. Um, so, but I always wanted to come home, and so came back back up to Edinburgh in the eighties. Sorry. We've had a question for you early on, early, early doors, as they say. We've had a question, and it's this. Uh, can Hannah tell us what percentage of the membership of the NFUS mm-hmm. is tenant farmers and how much influence they have on the organisation? I don't know the specific numbers. I would assume that a lot of tenant farmers, um, you know, most farmers are tenant farmers. Um, so it's that thing about realising that there's this impression that farmers are all loaded and wealthy and landowners. And you think, no, most farmers are tenant farmers and they're fam- they've been farming that ground for 100 years down yeah. through their family. Um, and they're just trying to make a living, you know. And certainly when we um, were involved in setting up farming for Yes, it was completely, you know, I think we were all tenant. Well, we, we were owners because we had bought, the farm at Whitmuir in 2000, but most people were tenant farmers. So the and and it's that thing of when you come into farming, it's such a shock that it's such a feudal system, you know, to come from a multi in Dundee with the council and suddenly end up in this world of farming and realise that if you're a tenant farmer, you've got less rights than a basic council house tenant. You know, so you spend all the time when you first come into this world going, are you kidding me? Are you joking? Is this how this works? This is ridiculous. People don't know that, you know. So if you're a tenant farmer, you've got um, very few rights over your tenure. You have to maintain the property at your own cost. You have to fix everything when you leave. You know, it's just ridiculous. You know, council house tenants have had rights, you know, for decades, they wouldn't put up with this nonsense. You Are know? you saying that people can be peremptorily thrown off the, the farm? No, it's that thing about a lot of people are living in very poor quality housing. Okay. Right? Yeah. And if they want to fix the windows or put in double glazing or insulation, they do all that at their own cost. Yeah. Okay. Right? Um, so it's this sort of, it's like going back in time mm. where you think, is this really how it works? Um, and in terms of influence in the NF US, um, I think they do try and listen. Um, you know, a lot of their members are tenant farmers, so obviously they've got a say. Um, but it, it's a it's a different culture. You know, it's understanding how that culture works yeah. and how people have been. People have got to make a living, and they they are not the the price setters. They're very much the people who do what they have to do to sell their produce at the terms that the big guys, the supermarkets say. Yeah. Um, so they're in a very, they don't have a lot of autonomy yeah. on how they run their businesses. And what effect do you think Brexit will have on that situation? Well, <sighs> catastrophic. I don't use that word lightly. Um, you know, we have a huge level of support from the European Union for farming in Scotland. Um, it, it's a triple whammy, you know, so the subsidy for farming is under threat. Um, one of the things in the UK internal market um, proposal is this whole thing about anyone thinking there's um, unfair competition. So in England, DEFRA, the Department of Environmental Food um, and Rural Affairs, is reducing all farming subsidy to zero over seven years, right? And the Scottish government have said they are going to protect farming subsidy for the next few years. So we're going to be in this situation where if um, if we don't get our independence, we will be at the mercy of what DEFRA says is going to happen with subsidy. And you won't be, in my view, I don't see how you can justify, I know how you justify supporting less fav- favoured area status and farmers in rural Scotland, but the UK government will not be willing to subsidise rural farming in in the north of Scotland if they're not subsidising, you know, farming in the south. So we lose the subsidy, we lose the frictionless access to a huge 
um, market for our produce. We lose the geographic indicators. So Scotch beef, Scotch whiskey, Scotch lamb, uh, Arbroath Smokies, that all goes on the 1st of January. Um, and most importantly, we use we lose the protection that our um, domestic market has. So at the moment, Europe protects farmers and standards. And because yeah. Europe is the biggest economic block in the world, it can tell everybody else to get lost. Yeah. On the 1st of January, we're in the cold, right? Yeah. We will not be able to protect our domestic markets because nobody is fighting our corner, yeah. you know? Well, so a, it's and, really scary. Yeah. And if there, are, if there are farmers watching us and listening to us tonight, where should they go for help and assistance? I mean, is, is I, I think, I think it's that thing about we... You know, there's a lot of anxiety in farming because they're constantly told by the UK government that their main export market is England. Yeah. You know, and they've got to like buckle down and do what they're told. And there's a lot in that white paper about we're the biggest, um, you know, England is the dominant partner and everybody has to do what they're told or they'll lose um, access to that market. And I think it's that thing about going through a farmer saying, and and sorry, the, the SNP haven't ever been seen as a, a pro-farming party. They're, they're sort of caricatured as an urban central belt party, which they aren't because there's plenty of people in the SNP support, you know, our farmers and support rural policies. So I think we have to be a safe haven for those people to say, please come and you know, who do you think is going to protect Scottish farmers? Do you think it's Boris Johnson or do you think it's us? You know, who do you think this land matters to? It's us. Who do you think should be in charge of what happens here? It's us, you know? So it's getting them to put their faith um, in an SNP government to protect them and support their um, livelihoods. And all the goodwill is there. You know, Fergus has done a, a great job in standing up for farmers and it's just helping them take that next step. And I think Brexit will push a lot of them. Don't you think you might be confused though, Heather? Because <clears throat> uh, all of this is going to happen, as you say, on the 1st of January. Uh, it's very unlikely that Scotland will be independent by the 1st of January. So they're going to have to sort of suck this up, as it were. Yep. Yep. And they're presumably going to say, well, how long do we have to do this for? Yeah, well, I think I think there's been this unbelievable faith they've had that the Tories will look after them. You know, even even though everything they the Tories do demonstrates that they're not interested in looking after them. They didn't vote to support standards. They didn't vote for alignment. You know, so I think. It's a bit like the clans, isn't it? After the clearances, it takes people an awful long time to realise the folk they've invested their trust in aren't on their side. Yeah. It's, it's a very deep cultural thing. This is the tribe that they are comfortable with. Um, so I think it's that thing about helping them place their faith okay. in a different Scotland and a new farming. That's our job. Okay. Let's go back to your story. I'd like to come back to that uh, later on. Let's go back to your story. You've had this, you were raised on, as you say, Elvis and socialism. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what was your journey from, <clears throat> uh, well, I assume you're still, uh, you're still look favourably upon Elvis, but oh. what changed? <laughs> Absolutely. It's the, the king is always there. Um, yeah. So, but what changed about, in your politics from being a Labour activist to all of a sudden you're in the SNP, supporting the SNP, an SNP councillor, and we'll come on to the MEP part yeah. later. But what made that, what caused that transition for you? Um, I think it was, a long, it was a long time coming. You know, I, I'm, you know, I never thought of the Labour Party as a unionist party. I don't think we ever discussed being in the union as part of our policies, you know, and it was way back in the 80s and I was in London and that's what we were doing and the Toll Cross Labour Party up in, in Edinburgh. Um, and I think it's just that thing about 
that journey to yes, you know, in, in the, the farming for yes, the whole thing about taking responsibility for yourself, not blame. I, I hate the politics of grievance, you know, saying we're in this situation because somebody's been bad to us. Yeah. So the thing that really attracted me to the SNP um, in the last sort of decade has been that thing about saying we're responsible. You know, if we make a mess, it's our mess. It's our decisions. We're accountable. Um, and seeing lots and lots of people that I really admired in the SNP who were working phenomenally hard. Yeah. Um, there was, when we um, came here in 2000, sort of 2005 to 2010, there was a lot of energy in the party around local food, um, you know, supporting um, local producers. And we were part of that, you know, so it was that thing about thinking these people take this seriously and they want to support us as producers. Yeah. Um, and I had my boys. So in the lead up into the referendum, my two sons kept coming in and saying, mum, read this, mum, look at this, mum, you've got to look at this. And so I think it was, a, I'd been voting, I voted for Alex Salmon, I'd voted SNP. But, and then I think you get to the point where you think, actually, I'm in this party and this party feels like family to me now. And you became a councillor. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I sort of got involved before the referendum through Farming for Yes. I was on the list back in, was it 2015 for the south of Scotland? Um, and the when the council elections came up, I remember going along to the branch and saying, are you looking for somebody to be a councillor? You know, so I got elected in 2017. I love being a councillor. Um, it's it's you get as I said just before the program hairdresser on the phone about grants for our business party houses you know you get everything as a councillor um, we so we are in the opposition in Scottish Borders Council we've got a fantastic SNP group a brilliant group leader Stuart Bell who's been a tremendous mentor and support and is so sharp and shrewd and capable um, so. I, I think it's that thing, and I got involved in. I'm the I'm now the convener of the Association of Nationalist Councillors. The ANC wasn't my African link; it was somebody else's. But um, so that that's the the body that represents all of the councillors in Scotland. Um, so we try and organise events, and I've I've had to cancel three events this year: one on um, the COP and climate change, one on recruiting new councillors, and one on um, the budget because of COVID. But um, as a group, we're now getting organised. We're having Zoom meetings. We've got an AGM in September with Mike Russell and Kate Forbes. Um, so it, it's just great to give. Councillors have played a phenomenally important role in this pandemic because suddenly everything came back to the councils and everybody's worked flat out to support communities. And I think that's really helped the relationship between um, Holyrood and the councillors. That's good. That's good. Do you ever see a time when you will be the majority party? Yeah. The council? Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> They're all old. <laughs> no, I think um, I stood as a councillor because I heard Susan Aitken saying we'd win independence by emptying the bins and fixing the roads. And yeah. I thought, oh, right, I better go and do that then, right? Yeah. And um, so I think our job in opposition... Um, as well as an administration, is to be competent, to be hardworking, to deliver for people. And in a sense, we're just normalising being pro-independence. It's yeah. not that there are people over there. You know, it's just these are ordinary people um, right. who support independence. It's completely normal to support yeah. independence. Yeah. yeah. It seems to me that's an important move, you know, that, uh, because essentially... It, uh, we've discussed on this programme before, uh, independence movements tend to confront a, a, a three-part uh, alignment, as it were. Uh, there's those who are always in favour and will always be in favour. There's the folks in the middle, about a, they constitute also about a third. And then there's the folks who will be opposed, regardless of what happens. Uh, they just yeah. don't like constitutional change. They, they, just, they just abhor the whole business. So eventually what happens is that the people in the middle determine the outcome. Yeah. It, it's yeah. persuading yeah. people in the middle to move towards, in, in Scotland it would be the yes camp, 
uh, many hundreds of years ago in the American environment, it would have been the Patriots. Uh, and once yeah. that group moves, uh, that yeah. clutches the, the decision, as it were. However, the decision is, 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 is contrived. That's generally what happens, that, that group in the middle. And as you said, yeah. they have to be persuaded. And they're persuaded yeah. on a whole range of different matters. And some are persuaded on the fact that their bins get emptied on time. Yeah, that's right. Do the job. Yeah, do the day job. And one of one of the councillors do it elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. One of the councillors on Scottish Borders Council, who I won't name, sat with me. We do an alternative budget every year. Um, and one of the councillors sat with me at the end and he said, How does someone like you end up in the SNP? <laughs> <laughs> just that thing about saying because I think we should be responsible for our own future and our own affairs and he said I've never heard it put like that you think, well think about it right yeah, yeah. You know, well yeah. actually in, in fairness I, I, I thought maybe this is what you're uh, going to mention uh, when you talked about eventually um, attaining control of the border council yeah. was that there must be lots of what are known uh, informally as, uh, as soft Tories who are concerned about things like waste uh, and, 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 and all of that good stuff, which is a traditional Tory issue, as it were. And they must be increasingly looking at all the waste that's going on and saying to themselves, this is not what I signed up for. Yeah. I didn't and sign it, up for all this nonsense. Brexit is phenomenal. Right, so it's had a huge impact. So we haven't had agricultural shows this year, but last year um, at the People's Agriculture Show, I was gobsmacked at the number of people who came up and said, well, if I have to choose between one union and another union, I'm choosing the European Union. Yeah. So that, that is a seismic shift yeah. of people looking up and saying, what future world do I want to live in? Do I want to live in this insular, you know, inward looking, backward looking um, country, or do I want to be part of the real world? Excellent. You know, and look out. Well, and it takes us very neatly <laughs> onto being an MEP. Oh yeah. Because there you were in that outside world, as it were. Yeah. So what was your experience? How did it come about? How do you feel about it? And what do you think people overseas think about the Scotland you represented? Um I, well, it came about because Alan Smith got elected to Westminster. And in the lead up to that election, um, Boris Johnson was basically threatening a no deal Brexit any day soon. Right. But when he won, he basically said we would leave the European Union on the 31st of January. Right. Yeah. So not next Tuesday, but the 31st of January. And um, I, I phoned up Mike Russell and said, we, we've got a seat. You know, there's a democratic deficit here. Um, we should be in that seat because the minute Alan stands down, I'm the next person on the list. Um, and so um, I have the Guinness Book of Records, I think, for being the shortest legal member of the European Parliament. I was there for three days legally, um, but not being one asked permission. I just got on a Ryan jet plane um, in January and went out and um, was part of the, you know, was in the Parliament for three weeks um, but not actually able to vote until, you know, I was determined we would have that vote to register our dissent yeah. against the withdrawal bill. And that was the real focus. And the other reason for going was to um, make a scene, you know, so basically <laughs> make sure that we were clearly identified as having a different position um, yeah. at that point and that whole thing about being dragged out against our will without our consent. So I really wanted to be there to make sure um, that we could make that statement to the rest of the world and be seen to make that statement to the rest of the world. And um, and uh, Michael Gove um, had promised that he would approve my appointment because it's a UK appointment, remember? Um, and it was three weeks of questions in Parliament um, pressure, Jacob Rees, smog, um, saying, I have no idea why anyone would want to go to the European Parliament and all this stuff. Um, so they held on and didn't give consent. And then I think I think Michael Gould basically thought, God, she'll be much worse being outside the chamber when they're taking the vote than being inside the chamber. <laughs> so um, they actually approved it on the Monday night at 10 o'clock um, before the vote on the Wednesday. 
So there was an email came through, and our our MPs in our SNP MPs were just fantastic. <laughs> Bought the corner. Yeah. But going to Europe was um, makes me cry. So Europe, in we are seen as a real country. We're seen as a real nation of grown-up people with something to contribute to the rest of the world. We're respectful of the agenda that Europe's pursuing. We're, we're at the front. So in terms of combating climate change, renewables, the circular economy, um, all the work we were doing before on food um, and local production, we've now got farm to fork in Europe. Um, we were seen as leaders, you know. Yeah. So it's that thing about I so wish people in Scotland could see how highly we're regarded. Um, and there is such warmth towards Scotland, yeah. you know, um, and people know who we are and know what we represent and want to welcome us back. And the European Union is in a very difficult situation because the UK government is the member state yeah. and the, UK, the European Union will always defend and protect the member states. Mm. But they're not a member state on one minute past midnight on the 1st of January. And that's when we start being an accession state. Right. Oh, really? Is that and how would that work then? I mean, what, well, what we have to get our independence. <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you think might change in the EU side come the first of January? Um, the UK aren't a member state anymore. I understand that, but what effect would you think that will have on the EU's relationship with Scotland? Okay. I would hope that it could be more transparent and open. You know, but we have to get our independence. We have to do the day job and yeah. secure our nationhood. You know, you can't be an accession nation if you're not a nation. Sure. You know? yeah. um, and so a big part of this journey is making sure that our journey towards independence is internationally validated and recognised and we're seen to have a case. And I think the big thing that happened was back in 2014, they didn't really get it, you know. But they get it now, yeah. you know. So people like Philip Lambert, the leader of the Greens, says Brexit is about English nationalism. Yeah. There's there's a shift in their understanding of our position. Okay, but you you don't expect anything particularly uh, provocative to come out of the EU. No, they wouldn't do anything provocative. But yeah, I think I think it's that thing about it's for us to do the work um, to get our independence yeah. and take our place in the world. Yeah, I mean, but I think some people might see this as a sort of maybe a mutually advantageous, might be one way to put it, of uh, the EU being able to cock a snook at what's left of the, the UK, as it were, by encouraging either uh, discreetly or overtly uh, any move towards independence in Scotland. Do you think that may be the case? I couldn't possibly comment. Of course not. Of course not. Um, but, but I know that they know who we are. I know that they welcome our contribution. I know that they know we want to be there, you know, and the, and I know that they now know that we were taken out against our will. And Scotland has the right to self, self-determination, just like any country. Yeah. And that, that universal right being recognised yeah. is important. Do you have any, any views on the uh, court case that's presently going through the uh, Scottish courts, you know, the forward is one group, uh, mounting a legal challenge based on the fact that both parliaments, the Scottish and Westminster Parliament, have both approved the claim of right, right? So therefore, uh, the court case is predicated upon that, that both parliaments have approved it, uh, and therefore uh, the Scottish Parliament ought to have the power uh, to go ahead with the referendum. Uh, have you followed this case? Or yeah, it- not, yeah, I'm aware it's going on, but I think it's that thing about the case for a referendum is a public case. You know, and, you know, so you could do the legal stuff, that's really important as a backup, and, but we're not going to win independence because we've won a legal case. So I think where we are now is the case, if, you know, may is the test. You know, the election in for Holyrood in May, having a huge mandate, having the authority, and then our right to contest our um, right to be independent is undeniable. 
right? It's, it's just not acceptable. Johnson can't stop it. You know, and the idea that the way you can stop a country becoming a national state is by saying we're not letting you have a vote is nonsense. It's, it's just It just falls apart as a mythology. And the way they're behaving just now shows how much they're taking that seriously. And, and I wish people in Scotland would realise they're much more worried about us getting our independence. Yeah. Um, you know, we're still in, the, some people are in the mode of still asking permission. Yeah. And we'll not get to do it because we'll not get permission. And I think we're, we're beyond that. You know, the rest of the world's looking on. So if we win the mandate to deny us an independence referendum, we'd be internationally unacceptable. It does sound a wee bit contradictory, though, Heather, because of, uh, you say we shouldn't have to ask, but we are actually doing it in the business of asking. We're in the business of saying, please, may we have a Section 30? Yeah. That's exactly that's, that's what we're doing. That's our constitutional are. arrangement. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and as Kenyon Wright would say, we, we, you know, we're at, we're at the end of this road, aren't we? Like the constitutional arrangement and the devolution settlement are under attack. The yeah. things that we thought were safe yeah. about our powers and the Sewell Convention and our right to give consent are being dismantled as we speak. So we're at the end of this part of the, okay. the story. Good point. I, I, I want to come back to this shortly, but I'd like to take a couple of questions if I may. Sorry, and here we are. Uh, Fair Murphy Fife is asking, uh, this is the first time I've heard of farmers for yes. Uh, can we get them more visible, please? Yeah, we didn't. Um, we did meet, um, like, uh, was it last year or the year before, saying, but we get the band back together. Um, but we didn't reconvene. So we're not constituted as a group at the moment. It was very much about 2014. Okay. Yeah. In, in fairness to Farmer, in fact, I, mis I misread his comment. Uh, that comment came from NDS 2014, who yeah. was the first time he'd heard of it. Of course, Herman from Fife had heard about it before, but he was more interested in the point of, of, of re-establishing the, the Farmer for Yes group. Uh, I take it Well, out. sort it out. <laughs> you know, get <laughs> out. There you are, Farmer for Fife. Okay. <laughs> Send out an email. Right, that's it, right. Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I, here's a rather self-serving one from the, our producer, Kevin. He's saying, uh, do you think, Heather, you would be interested in doing Zoom live shows for Farmers for Yes to spread the word? Um, yes, I'm interested in doing anything. There are great people in that group, like Jim Fairley was one of the leading people as well, who you'll know. Um, so if, if there are, we can do things differently now, can't we, because of this digital technology. So, um, and, and I think it's just, we do all these things on top of everything else we're doing, so it's having the time to do it. But I think it is an issue that has to be addressed. Um, so, yeah, I'd get Jim in, though, as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, if, if Jim's interested, all he has to do, or anyone's interested in Farmers for Yes, just need to contact Independence Live, and they'd yeah. be happy to talk about how that might be possible. Yeah. yeah. And it would allow Farmers for Yes to talk to, you know, a broad spectrum of people. Yeah. You know? It's clearly there's an appetite for knowing more about what you do and what yeah. and what the what the farming community is about. I mean, we only scratched the surface tonight. I have to tell you, there's yeah. a bunch of questions we could have gotten into, <laughs> but it's 1943, as it were, in terms of uh, 43 minutes past uh, seven. So yeah. we have limited time. Uh, <clears throat> uh, somebody's asking, do you think there's a possibility? that the accession that you talked of, i.e. Scotland's accession into the EU, could be fast-tracked? Um, I think our accession into the EU will be faster than most countries because we comply. We're a member state. We've got all the legislation. The Scottish um, Parliament is a rights-based organisation with the UN Convention of Human Rights. Yeah. You know, So we're not starting from a long way back. Um, and part of what we have to do is try and, you know, the, the continuity bill that's going through Parliament at the moment is about saying we want to keep pace with yeah. European regulation. We do not want to be, um, we don't have everything dismantled. It's going to be a fight. But I think um, we're a member state now, so it's not as difficult for us as other countries. You know, we comply. Yeah. I'm sure they would 
they're not going to fast track anybody. It doesn't work like that, but we don't have as much to do um, to get in. Well, if, if somebody, if a country doesn't have as much to do, that rather suggests... That's, that's, that's not them fast tracking us. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, okay. okay. I think I understand. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what, what's, your, what's your feeling about your future, your future. We'll come on to how you feel about Scotland's future, but let's talk a little bit about your future. I mean, you're very busy, you're running an organic farm, you're a very senior counsellor. Uh, I mean, all the other things that you've got on just now. But would you be interested in running for, say, a, a position in the Scottish Parliament? Would that be of interest to you at some stage? Um, absolutely. Um, I was on the list in 2015. Um, I'm I, I think we've, there's there's so many things I'm passionate about that I want to get on and do. So I think the thing about land use in Scotland, 42% of our land in Scotland is given over to deer mismanagement. You know, like, so we've got to build this country and use the assets of this country. We've got to support our food and farming structures. We've got to, you know, I'm passionate about the right to food and making sure that we don't have food banks in Scotland and that kids... Um, are, are never at risk of depending on charity to get yeah. the tea. You know, that's just an abomination. Yeah, so is. we've got so much to do about building a fair and equitable country. We've made such a phenomenal start. So I think that thing about building the country that we want to live in is something I'm passionate about and I'll contribute whatever way I can, you know, whether that's a councillor or in Holyrood um, in Europe. I'll, I'll do whatever I can. You're not going to shut me up if I don't. <laughs> That's an astonishing percentage of giving over to deer management. What I know. It's mental. Right? And we don't even eat the venison. We used to export it to Germany. So it's that whole thing about we're giving, you know, kids turkey twizzlers and we've got venison, right? So it's that thing about what is this land for? How do we best use this land for the benefit? of yeah. our economy, our people. Um, we've been, you know, Leslie Riddick always says that thing about we have to behave as if we own the place. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we did um, with the schools, we we ran this course called Growing Global Food Citizens on the Farm. And if you're a, glo a global food citizen, you know about the history of food in your country. You yeah. know how food affects you, how it affects the planet, how to grow food, how to cook food. Yeah. And so on this session about the history of food, we I graphicked, it's one of the things I used to do, I graphic the history of food in Scotland. Yeah. And it is this overwhelmingly um tragic story. You know, the big you've got feudalism comes in um and it stays there all yeah. the way along the line to the present time. Yeah. And we have exported our produce to other countries instead of thinking about how we feed ourselves. Yeah, and um, so we just got so much work to do in redesigning things. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's 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 definitely going to be interesting. Uh, we've got loads of questions coming in about independence. Uh, you know, Heather, what do you think the time span is until we get independence? What's the best case scenario, the worst case scenario, until we are actually independent? How long is this going to take? Um, well, May is critically important. Um, you know, a lot will happen next year, you know, one to two years, you know, would be what I would be hoping for. If it's longer than that, doesn't matter. We just keep going. You know, it's taken, I, th I think people forget how different it was in 2014, right? So in 2014, we didn't have this general consciousness of Scotland as a nation, you know, and we, we talk about Scotland as an, a nation, a, a government, um, all the time now. It's just part of common discourse. And it wasn't back in 2012, 2013. And, um, you know, we all talk about the First Minister. We know we've got a different different legislation. We've, with the vote um, last year, people finally voted the Scottish government as the most important government. So there's been this huge journey about seeing ourselves as a nation and not questioning that. So, and the polls are showing that most people think this is now normal. You know, it's not why would we be independent? It's why wouldn't we be independent, which is a very different argument. 
Yeah. You know, so uh, we're on the road. Um, Don't blow it. Uh, let's assume your uh, scenario, one year, two year, uh, is, is pretty accurate. It does mean then that that would be two years outside the EU with all the consequences that you mentioned earlier, uh, which sound extremely serious. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we could still have a situation where the Prime Minister of the UK, whoever that is at that time, because personally I don't expect it to be Boris Johnson, but it could well be Michael Gove, uh, yeah. who is steadfast in refusing and saying, well, I don't care. And furthermore, in that two-year period, it's entirely feasible that the Westminster government will pass a, a, a new act of union that says that the territorial integrity of the UK is sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. In other words, to secede would be treasonable, as it, would, as it is, for Spain. example, Spain right now. So there is a danger in a two-year scenario, or even a one-year scenario, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that... Um, I'm not saying I don't want it for two years, you know, I'll take it on the 1st of January if we can get it. Um, but I think that thing about, I think we're in the, the end game here um, and things can perhaps move very quickly. You know, when things fall apart, they fall apart and not on a set out timetable. Yeah. Um, and, the you know, the whole thing about them opening that new office, the whole thing about the Union Jack, the whole thing about Scotland, the brand not mattering. They, they are now, we're not being loft bombed anymore. Um, you know, th this is this is the end game and it's for the people of Scotland to say we're not taking this anymore. What's you know, the opposite so, of a love bomb? Is that a hate? <laughs> bomb? It's a know. Union Jack when a box of strawberries. <laughs> you tell a word for the opposite of a love bomb? Because that's certainly how it feels right now. It's how it yeah, feels. yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, I don't know if you know these folks. I'm going to ask you, but uh, a number of your fans, uh, maybe they're just recent fans. I don't know. Uh, Ruth Poole has written in. Do you know Ruth? I, I don't know. Oh, Ruth Poole says, "Great interview. Heather is so knowledgeable about food production in Scotland." John Payton Day says, "Superb interview, Heather." Thank you. <laughs> John Payton Day is going to be our candidate, but we're waiting on him getting approved but, yeah. um, for a by-election. Yeah. Yeah. And Ian Johnson says, uh, no rest until yes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the whole thing about we, when we spoke before, I remember I got the chance to interview Canon Kenyon Wright, the Constitutional Convention. Yeah. And he, you know, I was asking him, I was interviewing him about leadership and he kept saying, while there's chaos and madness going on, you have to keep focused yeah. on the direction and you have to bring everybody in at every point and keep them on the task. Yeah. And this is, a, this is a hard time for the SNP because we just need to say this, you know, all the way through the, the 2014 referendum, we kept saying keep the heat and that's where we are now. Yeah. You know, we're not under attack from the Tories in Scotland. We're not under attack from the Liberal Democrats. Um, the Greens are with us. We have to just focus on getting that mandate that is undeniable and getting recognition for it and finishing the job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so your, your feeling is that, hey, it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen sometime soon. Yeah, yeah it's going to happen sometime soon. Yeah. I mean, this is going to result in a, an additional burden for you. And let's assume that you're part of the SNP group at, uh, at, at Holyrood, and I do hope that happens, by the way. That's a personal Thank opinion. You. Uh, uh, you've still got Whitmuir <laughs> on your plate. Yeah. Well, you've still got the fact that well, you stay as a councillor. I mean, I mean, it just sounds like an, an incredible number of responsibilities. How would you cope with all of that? Oh, I'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> if you want a job done, get ask a busy person. Um, well, the farm, um, you know, we the farm shop, we had Lena who was running the farm shop up until COVID hit. We had this sort of disaster of the farm um, shop manager left to have a baby just at lockdown. Um, but she will come back. Um, the baby's great. Um, yeah. And we appointed a new shop manager last week. So the, all that business stuff runs itself. You know, um, I just got hold in when Lena left and we had a pandemic and a global, you know, a local food crisis. Um, so, you know, and 
so there is time to do that. Yes, we you'd stand down as a councillor. Um, you wouldn't carry, you wouldn't have dual mandate as a councillor and a, an MSP. That's normal. Um, but the passion and energy you would get from doing that job, you know, that we're in the early days of a new nation. And that gives you phenomenal energy because you're working on something you believe in. And it's that interesting thing in the Scottish borders. Um, we're, we're a fantastic group. We're all driven. We're all wanting to do stuff. And the thing that is debilitating is having an administration of folk who aren't really bothered about doing anything. And we have a, we have a cause. We have a focus. That's why we get up and do what we do. Um, so, yeah. Having a cause gives you energy. Yeah, there's no question about that. And you certainly demonstrated that tonight. No question about that. Right. Uh, so if you, were, if you were thinking about the audience tonight, what last message would you want to give to the folks who are watching and listening? Um, I think believing in ourselves, taking ourselves seriously, standing up you know, tall and saying, we're nearly there. This has been a long journey. The fact that the UK government are bringing out a white paper celebrating how good Falkirk and Creef were in 1720 shows you how panicked they are, right? So um, understand that they are taking us seriously. We have to keep taking ourselves seriously. We need to build the picture of what this independent nation is going to be um, and, and get there, you know, and next year is our year. We yeah. will get there. Now, one, one quick question, because it would be remiss of me not to put it to you. You're on the NEC. Yes. There's been a lot of very negative stuff around about the NEC recently. I, I, I should get an award for being one of the few people who haven't spoken to the press. <laughs> well, you have your chance now. It's not quite <laughs> but you have your chance now. Um, we've had a few... Very, very tough and difficult meetings, long meetings. Um, it is, a, a, you know, it's a huge group of people. It's been, you know, conducted on a computer screen. Um, it's very, it, so we're all very, very, very conscious and trying to do the right thing and do a good job. And I think it's... Um, I don't think anybody is on there to damage anything or wreck it, and we will keep the conversation going. We hear what everybody's saying. It's not a pleasant time to be on the NEC. You know, if you don't like the heat, get out of the kitchen. Um, but I think we're all very conscious of what's being said and taking it seriously and trying to address it. We're not taking any of it lightly. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always good to have a, a governing body as, as a widespread membership. But as somebody looking at it from the outside, it seems to have a lot of people on it. It's 40 odd people. And we only, we only met twice in person. Is it so, really necessary to have 40 people to get? Yes, I think it's, it's bigger than our council. You know? <laughs> yeah, so, and, and we, haven't, we haven't formed as a group, you know, because we only met twice in person. So I think, I think all that is making it really difficult to have. Um, robust conversations because you're looking at a screen and trying to work out who's saying what and all the rest. So um, I probably divulged too much information there. Um, so um, yeah, oh, it's too late now. It's too late. Now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, another, people another doing line. their best and working hard. Yeah, this this has become the uh, a little bit like the Heather Anderson fanzine here. Uh, Mandy McMillan says, "I'm thoroughly enjoying this." You have such great energy, Heather. Thank you. I know. That's because I'm doing what I believe in, you know, and, and you saw that in 2014, didn't you? You yeah. saw that people bursting with energy, bursting with hope, bursting with ideas, wanting to build a country. And we've got to plug that, you know, back in and see what could be more exciting than building the country you want to live in that you're proud to be in, you know? How could we not be energetic? Exactly. It's a fantastic time to be Scottish. And, and, and taking up that very point, it must be hugely disconcerting for the, for the, uh, the, the Tories and the Border Council to be confronted by people like you, when all they want is a quiet life. I know, I know. <laughs> they, they, 
<laughs> yeah. We have these briefings and um, the convener basically tries to, <laughs> he's doing his best, you know, and he'll say, well, we'll get questions at the end of this section. And then uh, I sort of have to go and say, I'm sorry, I've got eight questions. <laughs> You, you, yeah. you need to keep it up. You need to keep it up. Yeah. Well, we, this has been fantastic. We've almost come to an end now. And I have to say a big thank you to you, Heather. I loved it. Thank it's you. Hugely entertaining. And maybe at some stage you might consider coming back and, and talking to us again. Uh, and a big thanks to all of you out there watching and listening to the show. And we hope you've enjoyed it. We have a formidable list of guests lined up for future shows. <laughs> Next week, we have the famous Grouse Beater who's joining us. Gareth will be talking about his life and Scotland's future. Think about this. His Twitter site alone has over 50k readers, 50,000 readers a month. So join us next Wednesday at 7pm uh, for the Nation Talks to the Grouse Peter. And oh yes, look out for my Constitution column, please, on Sunday uh, in the Sunday National. I'll be writing about how pandemics shape countries. And very importantly, Please support Indie Live on Indie Live Radio. New voices for a new Scotland. And for all the news you're not getting from elsewhere, think about all the stuff that Heather's covered tonight. You wouldn't have found anywhere else, frankly. And if you like the TNT show, contribute to Indie Live. Thanks again and good night. And join us next Wednesday. And remember, it's a great day for British democracy. Good night, all. I'm Fiona from Clackman and Show Women for Independence. Did you know we have a podcast on Indie Live Radio? It goes out at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, repeated at 6 o'clock on a Thursday. Uh, come and join us for some news, views, opinions, the odd poem. It'd be very nice to have you with us. And come and hear the news you're not getting. Hear some new voices for a new Scotland at Indie Live Radio. Hello, my name's Steve B, and I'm a presenter on Indie Live Radio. I present Music and Musings every Friday night at 7. The music, that's 70s classic rock, although we will take the occasional side road. The Musings, well, their thoughts on Scottish independence, politics and world events from my viewpoint, which is that of a grumpy old man. So join me every Friday night at 7 on Indie Live Radio, a new voice for a new Scotland.
forward slash independence live. That's where you'll find the footage. No Westminster. No Westminster. Come on. No Westminster. Not for me. Hi there, I'm, I'm Cliff. And I'm Russ. And I'm from, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing a programme out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independence Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, pull up a sandbag. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot.